Number 13, the heart. Last Monday, I was at a local community college attending the interfaith meeting. And when I was there, the president was a keynote. It was a new president, a man from Trinidad. And he was, he was delivering the keynote presentation. <laughs> he said a lot of things. W one of the things that really caught my attention is he came up with this idea to deal with crime. He says that one of the biggest problems with crime is that once you go to jail, once you go to prison, when you get out, your job pro prospects are very minim minimized because of that experience, because they all want to ask if you've ever uh, been convicted of a crime, a felony or misdemeanor or whatever. So he was suggesting that for low-risk offenders that the, uh, the state or the county would send them to his community college uh, mandate that they attend. And he's thinking, oh, man, I'm an educator. Education just solves everything, doesn't it? You know, we take these people, we bring them in, we'll give them an education, they finish the two years, they get a, a skill, and they, and they can, we'll even help them find a job. You know, it was just, just a perfect solution to this problem. And I was just sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, that might work for some. There might be some who, you know, maybe rob a convenience store and the judge says to them, all right, you've got two choices. You can go to jail or you can go to the community college. And they're like, well, I think I'm going to take the community college. And the judge says, whoa, 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 but you've got to graduate or else you, you're going to go back, you're going to go to jail and serve your time. And, uh, but if you graduate, you have no criminal record. It's, it's kind of a brilliant idea in one sense. But the, the problem with it is uh, the heart, the heart. Because if you are forcing people to go do something, you don't have their heart. You just have their compliance. And before long, a college can become just the same as a prison, right? And uh, so you can, you can end up with all kinds of problems. I know because I went there, and it, it wasn't because I was mandated by the court, but when my heart wasn't into going to college, you know what? I got terrible grades. And then when it was into it, I got good grades. So really, that's, that's the issue, is the heart. And so that's what we're talking about today, is the heart and emotions. And what I want to begin with is talking about two quick cognitive distortions, as the psychologists call them. The first is emotional reasoning. And this is a, this is a process, you know, everybody does it to some degree, but if you do it a lot, you're going to have a difficult life. In fact, you're going to have major problems in your life. Emotional reasoning is when you draw conclusions about reality on the basis of your emotions. That makes sense, right? So you reason from your emotions to reality. I feel anxious, therefore I'm in danger. I feel depressed, therefore the world is a terrible place. Or... Um, you can imagine any other kind of emotion, and you just sort of project that into the, the world and state it as an objective fact that your subjective experience is determining the objective world. Um, another one is called catastrophizing, and this is where you assume the worst possible outcome is most likely. <laughs> that makes sense, right? You're, you're assuming a catastrophe at all times, right? And so I, I wrote up a little scenario for you. Your boss says to you, can you come in here for a minute? You say, oh, no, I'm going to get fired. Then I won't be able to afford my car payment or my apartment. I'll be riding the bus and staying in shelters. Then I'll never get another job. You go to the office. The boss says, can you grab the other end of my desk? I want to move it over there. You know, you catastrophize. You, you assume the worst possible scenario in that situation. And so uh, Lukanoff and Haight uh, have written this book, The Coddling of the American Mind, in which they identify these various cognitive distortions that they say are on the rise in our culture. So the, I just mentioned the first two to you, emotional reasoning and catastrophizing, but there's also overgeneralization. These are what psychologists recognize as bad behaviors, bad ways of being a human that get you into trouble in the world. Um, another one is dichotomous thinking, mind reading, that's assuming you know what somebody else is thinking, uh, labeling, negative filtering, discounting positives, 
uh, you know, your, your spouse does something nice for you and you say, oh, well, they're supposed to do that. They're my spouse. It doesn't mean anything. Um, or negative filtering is you always see the negative side of everything, no matter what. And then, of course, my personal favorite, blaming. I have a black belt in blaming. Uh, anybody wants to go toe-to-toe later, uh, <laughs> love, love to, uh, to, to do that with you. Um, so here is the, here is the problem. Uh, if, we, if, we blindly, if we blindly trust our emotions, okay, then we're likely to misperceive reality itself. And if you are out of touch with reality itself, you're going to hurt others and you're going to get hurt yourself. Right? Just like think of uh, somebody who is visually impaired. Okay? They, they, they're not able to perceive physical reality around them. They could knock into something while they're going along. If they're in an unfamiliar territory and they don't have a, uh, any way to um, check things, you know, with a cane or whatever, they, they could just bump into something and they could get hurt, right? And so it is with emotional reasoning in, in these other cognitive dysfunctions is that it, it can cause a lot of major problems. So I uh, just wanted to give you a little quote here. These guys, they talk about in the coddling of the American mind, this new uh, term, microaggressions, and I thought what they said here was pretty fascinating. They say, in moral judgment, as it has long been studied by psychologists, intent is essential for assessing guilt. So they want to say intent is what really matters. We generally hold people morally responsible for acts that they intend to commit. Most people understand concepts related to racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of bigotry in this way. They focus on intent. If on the basis of group membership you dislike people, wish them ill, or intend to do them harm, you are a bigot. Even if you say or do something that inadvertently or unintentionally helps members of that group. Conversely, if you accidentally say or do something to a member of a group um, that a group member finds offensive but harbor no dislike or ill will on the basis of the group membership, then you are not a bigot, even if you have said something clumsy or insensitive for which an apology is appropriate. A faux pas does not make someone an evil person or an aggressor. However, some activists say that bigotry is only about impact. That's that person's perceived reality. It doesn't matter that when you bumped into somebody, it was an accident. You were just rushing and you didn't see them there. They perceive that you singled them out and you bumped into them because they're in whatever group, a race or a sexual category or whatever. So that's their reality. And now you're going to be held responsible for their reality that they're emotionally experiencing, regardless of if you intended it or not. This creates a lot of conflict. Intent is not even necessary, they go on to say. If a member of an identity group feels offended, you see that, feels offended or oppressed by the action of another person, then according to the impact versus intent paradigm, that other person is guilty of an act of bigotry. And this engenders all kinds of tribalism because as soon as people start feeling offended, feeling injured, feeling hurt, what do they do? They start banding together into these groups that are going to do the sorts of things we looked at last time. I gave you two very extreme examples. The Nazis in Germany, you know, they, they, they exhibited tribalism, where they thought that their group was superior to all other groups and, you know, worthy of um, survival, uh, unlike the others. Or the uh, Hutus in Rwanda, same sort of thing with this uh, tribalism. So the, the, obviously that's like the worst case scenario, genocide, right? But these, these things are causing, this sort of like emotions leading each person is causing a lot of problems in our, in our world today. And the Christian approach gives um, a whole other way to think about this. And that is because of the biblical view of the heart. And so I'm really excited to share with you what the, the biblical view of the heart is. There's really two main things. First of all, uh, it's way worse than you think, your heart. You know, it's, it's, it's dark. Uh, there are problems. Uh, but then God has an excellent comprehensive solution that he can give to us to deal with our hearts. 
Okay? So that's really what I want to look at. The first uh, verse up on this is this really classic verse uh, is Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, those of us who are familiar with a Christian worldview, we know that God made people good in the beginning. Everything was good in the beginning. But we rebelled, we fell into sin, and so human, humankind is itself fallen. And that includes our heart. That includes uh, our emotions and our decision-making processes and, and the other aspects of what makes us us. So Jeremiah 17 is telling us, in a uh, post-fallen context here, in which we're all living as well, that the heart is deceitful. That word is key. That means that your heart can be wrong, dead wrong. It can be deceived, and it can, and it can be deceitful. It can, it can trick you into thinking one thing is true when it's not really true. Has that ever happened to you? Where you were so emotionally uh, angered enraged at a situation, and then you found out some little piece of information, and, every, and you were just like, you just totally read the whole thing wrong. Has that ever happened to you? That's happened to me plenty of times. <laughs> or the opposite, you think somebody's being really affectionate and kind to you, and then you find out they're just making fun of you, <laughs> right? That happens too, right? So um, this, is, this is part of the problem with our heart. And it's also, des it's not just sick. It's de look at these words here. It's uh, deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's a really depressing view of the human condition, isn't it? You know, I hear, I hear a lot of times people, people will say, oh, you know, people are born good and, you know, only if they're abused or put into a difficult hardship, then you know, they, they turn towards evil. You hear that all the time, people that say those kinds of, uh, that kind of sentiment. Uh, but what, what the scripture says is like, hey, look, no, you are the problem with the world. I mean, yeah, the weather sometimes acts up, but like generally out of all the evil in the world, it's us, it's humans that are the problem. And when we look within ourselves, that's where the source of the problem is itself. Uh, Jesus said it like this, Mark 7, 21, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft. This is what comes from within you. Okay, when he says man, he's talking about mankind. He's talking about humans. Okay, ladies, this, this applies to you too. Um, this is a general problem with us. Look within. If you look within deeply enough, this is what you're going to find. Not the only things you're going to find. You'll find some good stuff, too. But this is there, too. Uh, evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these come from within, and they defile a person. So that's, I mean, I, I uh, hesitate to, to uh, cut it off there because Ephesians 2 is just, asking to be read about how we're dead in trespasses and sins, and by nature, children of wrath, essentially dancing to the drumbeat of the devil. And Romans 1 is just itching over on the other side to say, hey, you know, we are just so full of issues and depravity and rebellion against God that, you know, he just gives us up to our own lusts of our flesh, our own evil desires, uh, but we don't have time for those. So what we're going to do instead is just, uh, just look within our hearts for a moment. What do we find there? What are the things we find in our heart? I'm, and I'm obviously just focusing on the negative side of things right now, but we find fear. Uh, statements like, what if I get fired tomorrow? That's a fear-based statement. We find lust. I want to use you to gratify myself. We find criticism. Wow, you left the house looking like that? We find arrogance. I'm better than you. I'm better than other people. We find laziness. I don't feel like doing anything today. We find a desire to control. It's my way or the highway. We find malice. I hope she doesn't get that promotion. We find greed. I deserve to have the new iPhone the day it comes out. We find depression. I'm no good. And we find rage. I will destroy you. <laughs> right? 
these are not the full range of human emotions, but it's just a little list that you know, I think can help us to think about like, look, these things are like, uh, I'm not going to do a survey, but I, I would bet you've experienced all of these at some point in your life. That's not good. So what, what is God? So this is what I call serious heart problems right here. These are heart problems. <laughs> so what does God do? He does two main things. There's the, the new birth. There's the act of being born again, regenerated, redeems what we call salvation a lot of times. So there's that aspect of it. Um, and then there's the, sanct- the process of sanctification, whereby we, are, we, we, are, we become more holy. We, we, we draw closer to God over time. So these, are, these are both parts of the solution. And then, of course, the ultimate solution to our heart problems is a heart transplant. And we'll get to look at that in a minute uh, at the end here when we look at Ezekiel. And that happens in the kingdom age. So it's really, a, a, I think I only have two in your notes, but it's really a three-dimensional solution to this problem. We have the act of salvation itself, the process of sanctification, and ultimately resurrection and the age to come. So, all right, looking at the first one, let's talk about some good news. I, I didn't want to, this whole thing to be depressing, okay? okay. But uh, the good news is we have, we have the new, new birth, and it works like this. First, first step, admit you're lost. Admit you have problems. Admit that you need help, that you can't save yourself. I love the analogy of uh, this one time I took my kids out to the uh, Mohawk River and we got a little too, too close and they got all muddy and uh, one of them sat down in the mud and lost a shoe and he tried to stand back up because it was just everywhere. And they, I, I finally got them back and uh, their hands are covered in mud and so are their legs and they're, and they're over there trying to clean their legs with their muddy hands. It doesn't work. We have muddy hands. We can't clean ourselves. So that's step one. Number two is believe that Jesus Christ, or the Messiah, Jesus, died for you to deal with your sins, to wash them away. We need someone outside of ourselves to cleanse us, to to heal us. Um, And we accept God's free gift of salvation from sin so that you can inherit The kingdom, that salvation from sin now is ultimately, the purpose for it is ultimately so that we would be able to be with God forever in paradise and have eternal life. And then, you know, once you've believed and accepted this sort of thing, now it's time to repent and enter into a covenant with God. A covenant is is a special word. It's a a solemn promise, just like marriage is a covenant. And uh, so you choose to enter into a covenant. Once you're in a covenant relationship with God, um, Life is different. Life is very different. He commits himself to you, and you commit yourself to him. And uh, part of that is this beautiful promise we have in in the Bible that he'll give you a new heart. We need a new heart. Uh, And we see this in Psalm 51 with David. I mean, boy, David really needed a new heart. He looked within his heart, and what did he find in there? Oh, he found murder. He found lust. He found every kind of deception, right? And uh, when he finally repented of his sins, he was confronted. He admitted he was wrong. You know, he, he, he repented of his sins. This is, this is what one of his prayers to God. It says, Psalm 51.1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And then in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So this is something that we can pray to God and we can receive. And this is usually something that happens when we first come to Christ. But it's something that we can also pray afterwards, right? If we find ourselves drifting and our heart is getting hard, if you do nothing in life, your heart will get hard, right? That's just the world we live in. It's, it's, it's a difficult place. There's hardship, right? Right? Uh, so your heart will get hard, and your heart will start to trick, and we need to pray this prayer, all of us. Uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then there's this other aspect that happens, we see in the scripture, called regeneration. I love that word, regeneration via the spirit. Regeneration is something that happens in the end, also, the whole idea of beginning again. But uh, Titus, I love this, this text here, Titus 3.3 3 says, 
For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, envy, hated by others, and hating one another. Look at that description of the pre-Christian. That's who we are by default. This is, this is the kind of thing that we get into. We're, we're foolish, but we don't know we're foolish. We think we're wise. We're led astray, but we think we're, we know what we're doing. We think we know the directions, and we think we're in control. I'm doing it my way, but you're really a slave to your various passions. I love that description. That's so spot on. It says, hated by others and hating one another. <laughs> Verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing, and this is that word, of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration and renewal. This is part of the Christian conversion experience which He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I mean, if you want a, a short little summary of the whole, the whole salvation story uh, or the effects of salvation, there it is, Titus 3, 3 to 7. Really powerful. All right, so once, once God has done this work to quicken our dead hearts, and to uh, create in us a new heart, and to regenerate us, infusing us with His Spirit, now what? Now we begin the process of what I call, uh, or what the Scriptures call, sanctification. The process of becoming holy. And uh, what is holiness other than just drawing closer to God? That's what holiness is. God is holy, holy, holy. He is as holy as you could possibly be. And so if you want to be close to God, you got to be holy. And the holier you are, the closer to God and the more sweet and enjoyable that fellowship can be because there's, there, there are fewer things separating you from God, right? And I know that holiness is generally almost like a negative in our culture today, but in the Bible, it's not a negative. It's a very positive thing. Um, so anyhow, sanctification. And I, I want to introduce this other word to you too called inkratia, inkratia. It's the word that means, uh, uh, it's usually translated self-control in the Bible. But according to the BDAG, it is uh, restraint of one's emotions, impulses, or desires, self-control. Oh, there it is, self-control. I really like this word. Have you heard of a, uh, uh, a Democrat? A Democrat, not in, in American politics, but like just the word Democrat is the idea of the demos is the Greek word for people, and krato is a word for rule or power. And you have aristocrats, that's when the rich people have the power, right? This word krat says in kratia, the power is inside, in inner power, self-mastery, an inward power. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, so let me just give you a couple of examples of this mindset of how the Bible handles the heart and how we should deal with our crazy hearts. Uh, one, one is uh, Proverbs 16.32. It says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. So what is, what is the insight there? The insight there is when it comes from a biblical point of view, from a Christian worldview point of view, when it comes to, to, to a situation where you're feeling the frustration rising and, and, you, and you're starting to get angry and, and your fists are starting to clench and you're starting to white knuckle the situation, right? There's no Elsa Let It Go song to be sung here. Okay, you remember that from last time with Jerry? It's not let it go, and then, you know, suddenly we're in the middle of a Quentin Tarantino fight scene where, like, stuff is flying everywhere, and there's blood. No, no! You will go to jail if you let it go. Don't let it go. <laughs> what you can do instead is be, first of all, slow to anger. Don't be quick to anger. Don't just be like, I'm really mad, so I'm going to act on it because that's who I truly am, and that's, I just have to be authentic. No, that's not how, that's how you go to jail, once again. 
And then you'll be stuck at the community college. You don't want to go. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so it says be slow to anger. And then it says, you know what? The best case scenario is just to rule your spirit. You rule your spirit. You don't give it to that power over to somebody else. It's not other control. It's not uh, where you're giving the power to the person that's irritating. You don't want to give that person power. You take the power. Who's that sang the song, I've Got the Power? There it is. Who was that? Nobody knows. All right. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a famous song. Proverbs twelve sixteen. Tina Turner, right? I don't know. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. There's another idea. You don't have to act on every insult that comes your way. You can, a prudent person can ignore an insult. Uh, so this is this whole idea of, of self-control. God, this is another huge... So the first aspect is, okay, your heart is tricky, and it, it has wickedness built within it. So you really need God to save you and to cleanse you. All right, God saves you, He cleanses you. Guess what? You've got good stuff now, but you, you still have some baggage left over. We're still, he still leaves that there. He doesn't, he doesn't make us 100% kingdom-ready people right now. We, we, you know, we, still, we still have to fight the fight. I don't know if anybody noticed that. Okay, so how do we fight the fight? Well, first of all, recognizing that you have the power. You are in control. It's not your emotions. It's you. So how do you get control? Through God's Spirit. Through His Spirit, He can help us. And the first step of all that is to take your heart and, and trust in God. This is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make, your, make straight your paths. So the idea here is that we would trust in Yahweh, we would trust in the Lord, we would trust in our God with just a small part of our heart. No! No! Oh! You realize how big a verse that is? Take your heart and give it 100% to God and say, I trust you with all my heart. I, I commit it to you. I'm not going to depend on my own understanding. I'm not going, I'm not going to depend on my own emotional intuition, my own intellectual understanding. I'm, gonna, I'm going to trust that you, as God, as Creator, as Almighty, know what you're doing, and I'm going to entrust my heart to you. And then... We have this incredible empowerment of the Spirit. This is in Galatians chapter 5, it says in verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Good, short, simple statement there, Galatians 5, 16. Look, you walk by the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the desires of the flesh. If your problem is fulfilling the desires of the flesh, which is, I think, a lot of us, that, you know, it's a good summary for it. Walk by the Spirit, because you can't do both at the same time. Verse 17, what is the desires of the flesh? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here we go. Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Here we go. Here's our list. Sexual immorality. Look at that. First up on the list, we think we're so progressive as a society. We, oh, we talk about sex now. Come on. First century. He's like, you know what? The first thing up is pornea. That's the Greek word for sexual immorality. Number two, pretty related, impurity. Number three, not that different, sensuality, right? I mean, humans are humans. You know, we're still dealing with the same flaws and problems. Then we have idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. Oh, I've been struggling with that one late, lately. I, I just really like some prayer. <laughs> <laughs> said no one ever all right and things like these i love that part just like and other stuff that goes along with this i warn you as i warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of god ladies and gentlemen that is a serious sentence if you do those things look some of those things that i'm joking about the orgy one but like envy if you give yourself over to envy you you're not getting into the kingdom of god uh, or fits of anger? Oh, I just have a temper. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't get to just let it go. You know, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the way 
it works if you're a Christian. Verse 22, look at the contrast. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, incretia, self-control. Against such there is no law. So this is what God has provided for us through His empowerment in the Spirit to overcome the, the bad things that are stuck in our hearts, right? And then what ends up happening instead is that within our hearts, we find, we find these things. We find the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, who wants to have rage in their heart when they can have peace? Who wants to have dysfunction and chaos and malice in, in your heart when you can have goodness and gentleness and kindness? Um, and then we also have the example of Jesus, which we're not going to have time to look at tonight because I'm just about out of time here. But in 1 Peter, it says that we are called to walk in his steps. And then the other one I wanted to mention is that in the end, we get a heart transplant. And that's Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 28 says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Look at that. We'll actually do what he says all the time. Wouldn't that be great? And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you, this is my favorite part, you shall be my people, and I will be your God. All right, so in conclusion, we have a lot of different things going on in our hearts. We could have depression, or we could have joy. We could have fear, or we could have confidence. We could have a desire to be in control of situations or people, or we can extend freedom to others. That's like the serenity prayer. We could have malice. That's where you want bad things to happen to people. Or we could, we could find a desire within our hearts to encourage others. Think of Timmy Paul. He's a great encourager. Uh, we could have greed, where we're just like, oh, I need, to, I need to have more. I need to have more. Or generosity. I need to give away more. We could have arrogance or humility, criticism or magnanimity, Magnanim oh. magnanimity. <laughs> I think I got it right the first time, and it just sounded so weird. But that's, okay, so criticism is like, I can't believe you did that, or you look that way, or you think that, right? You're being hypercritical of people. To, be, to have a magnanimous heart is to be somebody who is always extending, you know, just thinking the best of others. You know what I mean? You're not, you're not thinking badly about them, but you're thinking, hey, you know, he probably had a bad day, and that's why he's, he's acting like that. You don't think, oh, he's a creep, and I hate him, and I'm going to start a petition to destroy his life. No. No, that's, that's that small-mindedness. And then you have rage, or no, laziness versus alacrity, which is uh, enthusiasm. And then you have rage, which is anger, versus peace, and then lust versus purity. I mean, what side of this do you want to have? in your life. I want to be on the, on the right side, which for you is that side, right? I, I want to be on that side of things, the side that has the love and the joy and the peace. So uh, that's a little bit about what the Bible teaches about your heart.